All right, so welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. And uh, I'm Heidi Ellis from Western New England University. And my colleague, Greg Hislop is from Drexel University and we'll hear from him a bit later. Uh, let me start uh, for those of you that were here for the previous talk and say, thumbs up to Ellen, yes. Great job with students um, and really good advice on getting students involved in open source projects. The interactions between students and open source communities can have some really interesting twists and turns. Um, and we tend to use the term um, productively lost because as Ellen said, when you put a student into half a million lines of code, they're not gonna understand how to navigate. So creating a class diagram is a great, a great way to get started. Appreciate that. So we're gonna be talking about how open source and um, how we can increase diversity in computing through open source. And our goal is we want a, a diverse workforce. We want um, a wide range of ideas coming in so that we have maximum creativity, right? So we'd like our workforce to look something like this. The current status of the workforce tends to look more along these lines, all right? So, and when we look at computing, diversity in computing tends to be worse than in many other disciplines. One clear reason for this is most people come into, although we've heard a number of talks today about people who came into computing, to the computing workforce sideways, many people still come through college and computing students are mainly uh, white men, okay? Our work in open source uh, makes us believe that open source has a story that can appeal to women and other represented groups. But a lot of other students don't understand open source. So there are some places, clearly Mills College is one, but there's many institutions in where students aren't really exposed to open source. So we're trying to create a pipeline between education and the FOSS community, all right? So just to show you some recent figures, uh, I pulled these actually, these are from April of 2020 from the National Center for Women in Technology. And as we all know, the number of women in the computing force is quite low. One of the main reasons for that is there's only 21% of the CS bachelor's degrees are awarded to women. So we have a pipeline problem, okay? And again, as I had said, students aren't exposed to much open source in their studies. They know open source is something free they can download for themselves, but they don't understand this whole community community-based development. They don't get the implications for privacy and security. They don't understand the scale of, and importance of, of open source. So we have a recognized problem, the lack of diversity. There's also, unfortunately, another problem in the computing industry that has the potential to um, increase the barrier to diversifying computing. So uh, 20 years ago, technology was the golden thing to do, right? The, the intro to Google era, era, people were like, yeah, let's do tech. In the last five years, we've seen uh, many more stories that um, are tarnishing a bit of that golden aura. Social media has become a, a means for some invasive information collection. Tech now is sometimes viewed as big brother um, and more profit driven. There are increasing security breaches and cyber crime um, and then algorithmic bias. And I just, I popped these up. This was my um, reading for the summer um, as I wanted to retrench in the area, okay? Open source has these problems in spades, unfortunately. There's an intolerance, there's a lack of inclusion. Um, flaming and RTFM occur, right? There's misogyny in FOSS. Um, and there's things like resistance to codes of conduct, right? And all of this tends to create an environment that is not welcoming to, um, to creating, is not ideal for creating a diverse workspace. So a group of academics have been looking at how do we change this? Can FOSS be more attractive to women and other represented groups. 
right? So this is some research that started within humanitarian FOSS in about 2006. And the National Science Foundation is interested in this. They have funded five grants in this area since 2009. In addition, Red Hat, Google, Mozilla, Linux Foundation, and Wikimedia have all been involved and supported this, this effort. Um, and students have worked on a variety of projects across uh, Mozilla accessibility, GNOME accessibility. Um, so, so this is a, an effort into can we make FOSS more attractive to a wider range of people. So to give you just a little peek at research, I'm not gonna get into a huge amount of detail, but I'll give you some highlights. In our recent work, we surveyed undergraduates at the beginning of computing courses. So these were freshmen and sophomores. And we, this is recent work. It was carried out between October and February. So October of 2019 through February of 2020 at two institutions. Western New England University and Nassau Community College. And Nassau Community College is a minority serving institution. We uh, gave out a total of, or got back a total of 291 surveys. Out of that, we had 288 that were usable that had enough data that we could actually look at that way. So one of the things that we wanted to know was what is the impact of the application area? Would students be more interested in developing applications that were, that somehow had some social benefit to them? And so what we did was we gave students a list of 20 possible topics to create an application. And we asked them to give us our, their top three choices. So out of these 20, tell us which of the top three that you would like. And interesting to note, women chose human trafficking as the most, that was the most commonly chose option for women. Another interesting thing to, to note about this is that as compared to men, and I'll show you the men in a, in a minute, the women had more, um, had more diversification in their selections. So when we look at men, a higher percentage of men were focused on role-playing games, password security, board games, all right? And so, so those were very popular compared to the women, we had 23%. So they spread their choices over a larger number of different application areas. So, and as we can see here, um, the top choices for men didn't, didn't have a lot of social relevance to them. So what we did was we went through and we, we took those 20 topics and we ranked them as either having social impact, such as human trafficking, or having less or, or little social impact, um, positive social impact, fantasy football. And what we found is that women, that females preferred topics with social impact significantly more than men. So this order of significance means that if you did the survey that we did 10 million times, you would have three instances or three surveys where you didn't see the difference between men and women that was based um, on the population, that it was random. Okay, so that's huge. The other thing that we found is that Black and Latinx students were strongly motivated to help others. Okay, now I'm going to turn this over to Greg. Okay, thanks. So, um, the point on this talk, I'm going to I'm going to emphasize one point about what Heidi said. You know, we have this evidence that women students are attracted to computing because of things like seeing computing as something that can do social good. Uh, they're also interested in collaborative things. Uh, they're drawn to community-based efforts. All those things have not only our evidence, the kind of surveys that Heidi was just quoting, but uh, surveys done by other groups over and over again indicate that that the underrepresented groups that we're trying to attract, the, the women students, and also for some of these categories, uh, other underrepresented groups are attracted by understanding computing in sense of, in, in terms of collaboration, community, um, giving back, those, those sorts of things. Uh, and for those of us that are in open source, everybody in open source, uh, there's a story about open source that we all know, right? We've all drunk the Kool-Aid along the way and believe in these kind of fundamental principles about open source. And, and if you think about 
what attracts these groups that we want to attract and what open source is about, it's like a match made in heaven that we need to be telling the story of open source to students because students don't know it. Over and over again, we find when we survey students, they don't understand open source. They know it, they all open, oh yeah, I know open source, I use open source, but that's all they know. I can get stuff for free. That literally is what most students know. They don't understand how it works. They don't understand how big it is. They don't understand how large a part of the software industry it is. They don't understand licensing and IP. They have no idea that people earn a living doing open source. When I say that to classes of students, and I'm talking about senior computer science majors, they just, their eyes get big and they're like, what? <laughs> they don't understand that that's a thing. So we need to break out of the mold. I think a lot of times when people live in a, in a culture and, and most of the people that are at this conference are already heavily invested in open source, we forget or we lose sight of how little people outside the culture understand the culture. So we need to, to understand that. And we're telling you that over and over again, students don't know this and, and potential students certainly don't know it. So if you ever talk to a, a college class, if you ever talk to a high school career night, these are things you wanna talk about because they're the things that are likely to attract more of the underrepresented groups into computing. So we got four or five slides here. I'm just gonna go through them really quick because this is all very familiar turf, but these are the kind of pieces that should jump out when you have a chance to talk to students talk to high school students, talk to college students, right? Open source is about sharing and giving. Open source is about transparency, right? Anybody can study the source code. Anybody can learn from open source. Open source sets up wonderful mechanisms to be able to verify what a software product that you want to use actually is doing under the covers. It sets up a wonderful environment for promoting security and ensuring that security is really secure, right? Open source sets up a great way for us to have community. When you become involved in open source, you join a community. Students have no idea that that's the case. You know, so the whole notion of community in open source and that the community is more than just people who program, that it's a whole bunch of people that bring all kinds of different skills to an open source project. That is completely invisible to students or potential students of computing. There's another wrinkle to this, you know, Heidi and I believe all of what we just said, we've drunk the Kool-Aid too, you know, and we talk to students about this for open source broadly. We actually think there's a double whammy that we use in the classroom, which is we not only want to introduce students to open source in all those contexts that I just described, but we focus particularly on humanitarian open source, where the purpose of the existence of the project is to accomplish some social good. Next one, Heidi. So you have to understand the context of this is that most universities don't cover open source. This is another piece that we always wanna hammer when we talk to people in open source communities. Everybody thinks that universities teach open source and that it's just part of the curriculum. It's not, right? We have done faculty development workshops for around 150 universities across the country. Almost without exception, there's no open source being taught in, the, in those programs. These are computer science programs at many colleges whose names you would recognize. And, and we want to try and change that, but we need a lot of push to do that. And, and HFOS is one of the levers that we've been doing that. Students don't even understand GitHub. Uh, Ellen set us up, I think, very well for this. She talked a little bit about some of the, the experiences she's had. Absolutely right on with everything that she said in the last talk. All right. So we, we have this um, community, community, if you're interested in what we're doing specifically in education, the, the bulk of our talk, the main focus of our talk is to say, hey, you know open source, tell that story to people outside the open source community. If you're interested in what we're doing, we'd be happy to talk to you more. Um, we have these, uh, these resources, you can go and look at teachingopensource.org or fosterserve.org. Uh, teachingopensource.org has a low volume mailing list that we invite community members to be on as well as faculty to be on. So I think I managed to get in under our time or pretty close to it. Um, but that basically sets up the idea that we wanted to share with, with the people who tend to attend uh, All Things Open. And we have at least a minute for questions and Heidi and I will also be on the panel, which starts about 20 minutes from now. Okay. Do you have any questions or comments? So, so one of the previous comments was um, in the in the chat was Shambi, who said she worked mainly with K through twelve. We've had um, some success with people um, working with open source projects. Typically, at that level, at the K through twelve level, it's students are doing mostly observational 
it's really hard to get somebody who's in high school to actually go through the process, become part of the community and make a contribution, but they can sure learn a lot in K through 12. Okay, let's see. And I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A, so great. So thank you all for coming. We appreciate it.